Uh, this hearing, uh, I guess we're, it's a joint hearing now of uh, uh, both the Asian subcommittees and the Oversight Investigation Subcommittee will come to order. And uh, uh, we will have uh, opening statements. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming today. I want to thank my colleagues for joining us. And uh, uh, we're going to open uh, up this hearing uh, with an introduction to this subject matter uh, with a video shot earlier this year uh, showing the events just before and during and after the April 8th attack on Camp Ashraf by Iraqi soldiers operating under the orders of the Baghdad government of Prime Minister Maliki. It is a short video and uh, about one minute it was filmed by a resident of Camp Ashraf and uh, edited uh, from a much larger collection of film recorded during those days. Uh, the narrative uh, is that while U.S. military personnel were present, the Iraqi forces were held in check, but when U.S. soldiers were ordered to leave the area, the Iraqi troops attacked. Later confirming the casualties uh, of the attack, U.S. personnel did return and give aid to the wounded and take witness of those who had been killed. And again, this hearing is a hearing of two subcommittees. Uh, we will be uh, giving opening remarks and uh, uh, after this uh, short video. Uh, you may proceed with the video. U.S. unit evacuates Ashraf at 8 p.m. of April 7, 2011. U.S. delegation examines the corpses. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I'd like to uh, draw attention also to the posters underneath there. If you notice during the video, uh, you saw that gentleman aiming his rifle and shooting. Uh, any, uh, that was what we call premeditated murder. The people who were being targeted by that individual who was aiming his gun were unarmed civilians. Uh, this in itself is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, when they kill one or two people, it's murder. When you kill tens of people, it becomes uh, an atrocity and perhaps even a war crime. And the fact that this was being done uh, by a, uh, uh, at the, uh, at least at the, with the approval of the Iraqi government, uh, is something that uh, is of great concern to the United States, especially when the beginning of the video uh, shows U.S. troops exiting the area just prior to uh, this atrocity. This hearing is the uh, last chance for Congress to impress upon the State Department the gravity of the crisis that we face and the stain on American honor that will result if action is not taken to avert another massacre of unarmed civilians at Camp Ashraf. If that bloodletting happens, it will be a crime perpetrated by a conspiracy between Iraqi Prime Minister Maliki and the Iranian theocracy, which is pulling the strings. Whatever is going on, uh, and, and whatever has been going on for two decades, since the arrival of U.S. forces 
in 2003, Camp Ashraf has been a peaceful community of political dissidents and refugees, uh, which uh, certainly a community since we have arrived there in, in 2003, which does not deserve the label of terrorist. As we've been told by the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, that the U.S. terrorist designation, and this is representatives of the U.S. High Commissioner, I might say, uh, have in the past told us that the terrorist designation is a major obstacle to finding safe places to relocate Camp Ashraf's residents outside of Iraq. And the United States listing of the MEK as terrorists will be used by Maliki to justify his murderous cooperation with Iran. Why are we, the United States, being an accomplice to this crime? If they are deported or subjected to another massacre, the blood in the sand will also stain the Gucci shoes of our U.S. State Department. Maliki's alignment with the vicious Iranian theocracy is clear. To please his Tehran masters, he has already inflicted violence and death on the Camp Ashraf population. In the early, as we have just seen, in the early hours of April 8th this year, units of the Iraqi army numbering 2,500, including armored vehicles, assaulted unarmed Iranian civilians at Camp Ashraf, murdering at least 34 residents and wounding hundreds more. As we saw in the video, this wasn't just random shooting. There were individuals who were picking out targets unarmed people and shooting them as if they were deer in a deer hunt. As we just saw, as I say, well, we also just saw that American military personnel were pulled out of the camp just hours before that attack. What does that tell us? What does that tell us? Someone made that decision. This was an atrocity and a crime against humanity. Some media outlets have noted that the attacking troops were, and I quote, armed and trained by the United States, end of quote. And when you see that, and you see that group of dead bodies, and you notice that all of these people were unarmed, this is a shame on them and a shame on us. Camp Ashcroft residents had been promised protection under the Fourth Geneva Convention by senior U.S commanders in Iraq. Uh, let's see, this is, was that, there it is, right over there. Uh, there's a poster right there that's showing that an ID card that was issued to camp, a camp resident, and the agreement, I guess that's what this one is, that's what I was pointing to was before we started. Uh, this poster is, shows the agreement uh, between the camp and the United States, trading a pledge of peace uh, and disarmament for American protection. The reason the camp was disarmed, the reason these people had no means of defending themselves, was that they had made an agreement with the United States government to disarm. And thus they were shot down as if they were uh, deer being hunted by hunters. No way to defend themselves. When sovereignty was uh, turned over to Iraq, the transfer of responsibility for Camp Ashraf to, Bag to the Baghdad government was conditioned on a direct promise that the residents would continue to be protected in April of uh, the United States utterly and completely failed its responsibilities after making that promise to the people of Camp Ashraf. Uh, after the attack, the State Department asserted that a, quote, crisis and loss of life was initiated by the government of Iraq and that the, and the Iraqi military, end of quote. But what about before the attack, as I just mentioned? The U.S. Embassy and the commander of U.S. forces undoubtedly knew of the Iraqi military buildup outside the camp. Was the Iraqi government then contacted? We need to know that. If so, what was the Iraqi response when we contacted them? 
And as I mentioned before as well, the U.S. military unit deployed near Camp Ashraf was ordered away just before the attack. Well, obviously, it, uh, if, if not obviously, uh, perhaps on the face of it, it appears to be that there was a conspiracy, including our government and the Maliki government, to commit murder, to take the lives of unarmed people. So who in our government knew about this? What type of agreement was made? And why was nothing done to prevent it if we did know about it? Uh, we wanted to ask the State Department officials these questions, but we're told no one was available to testify at the hearing of this subcommittee on July 7th. Uh, will we and can we, are we uh, even trying to evacuate the residents of Camp Ashraw in the next three weeks? America has spent its blood and treasure, a trillion dollars, blood of thousands of our young men and women, only to allow a government to come to power in Baghdad that is the puppet of the Iranian mullah dictatorship. The Iranian mullah dictatorship, the most dangerous enemy of America and threat to peace and stability in the Middle East. And the government that we fought and paid for and bled for in order to, to bring into existence has now become their ally. In his recent op-ed uh, in the Washington Post, Prime Minister Maliki cited the U.S. listing of the MEK as a terrorist group and called them, quote, insurgents, end of quote, using this justification for the int his intransigence towards Camp Ashraf. So, if the Iraqi Prime Minister cannot discuss U.S.-Iraqi relations without mentioning Ashraf, and cannot mention Afrosh, Afrosh without mentioning the terrorist listening, uh, how can we deal with this issue without talking about our government's listing of the residents of Camp Ashraf as being terrorists? In 1997, Iran persuaded the Clinton administration to put the MEK on the State Department's terrorist, uh, foreign terrorist organization list. Uh, this naive gesture was supposed to improve relations with Tehran. But the relations did not improve, and Iran continues to support violence across the region and crush dissent at home and develop nuclear weapons capabilities that we have no idea whether we are the target, or Israel, or some of the other uh, countries which the Mullah dictatorship doesn't like. Uh, we have been told that the State Department is reevaluating the MEK designation as terrorists. In her appearance before the Foreign Affairs Committee on October 27th, Secretary of State Clinton acknowledged that the European Union has taken the MEK off its terrorist list, which it did in 2009. But uh, the State, uh, but the State Department uh, hasn't taken them off the list. But the Europeans have done so. And the clock is running out. The U.S. should continue to insist that the promise given by uh, the United States and uh, the, uh, to the uh, residents of Camp Ashraf and the promise then given by the Iraqi government to us must be respected and upheld. This is not just a matter of decency but of the credibility of the Maliki government and the honor of the people of the United States. The Iraqi government must allow the UN High Commissioner on Refugees to fulfill his mission in moving the residents of Camp Ashraf out of Iraq to safe havens in other countries with the full support of the United States. Mr. Carnahan, uh, uh, would you like to proceed with your opening?